Okay, welcome everyone to our first session of uh, the politics of resentment and uh, a working group on antisocial affects. So we're sitting here at this kind of um, interstitial or interregnum period of the American election. Uh, and we have half of the country mired in some form of resentment over the outcome of the uh, event of the general election. So uh, it's very obvious to any onlooker that um, the contemporary scene, uh, politically speaking, globally, from the resurgence of populism, whether that be right-wing or left-wing populism, um, even to the introduction of what is broadly known as neoliberalism starting in the late 70s, early 80s, has um, skyrocketed uh, a, a new form of um, antisocial affect within civil society, within politics. So, uh, so, so with that, we, we also recognize that our interlocutors, the great thinkers that we turn to from the psychoanalytic and philosophical community, people like Herbert Marcuse, people like Lacan, people like Freud, uh, they come from a different time. They're not uh, subjected to the world that we are in, right? So we have to read them with a critical edge, a critical eye, right? We can't sort of take their doctrine as sacrosanct. Yeah? And so in that spirit, I want to invite us to resituate our understanding of, of negative affects, of affect theory, of, uh, of even of resentment itself, right? So tonight I have um, the following agenda for you. Let me pull it up here. Okay, so, so we have given ourselves a, a name, which is the study groups on psychoanalysis and politics. This is sort of uh, a pandemic institution that has morphed and come into being. Um, and so you are all, you are all members of this uh, effort. And uh, this is our, the title of tonight's uh, agenda. So the first thing we want to do is we want to uh, make an account of this Nietzschean, uh, very famous, very important concept of, of not just resentment, but not, sorry, not just resentment, but resentment, this sort of, you know, deeper um, embedded form of resentment, which um, for Nietzsche uh, uh, molds the, the, the species being of the human, right? and actually um, um, separates uh, humanity into classes, right? So for Nietzsche, um, part of what I want to, to do is offer to you a new reading of how we understand resentment from a Nietzschean lens. And for that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lean on the work of um, a Marxist historian who recently died by the name of uh, Dominicio Losurdo, who's an Italian who wrote a uh, thousand page uh, biography, sort of, sort of like a psychobiography and an intellectual history of, of, of Nietzsche's work, completely uh, upending our common conception of, of his thought, including of the concept of resentment. Um, then I wanna turn to um, a debate that Wendy Brown, Wendy Brown's gonna open us, but she's gonna remain throughout because um, in the ruins of neoliberalism, the, the text that we, that I had you all read tonight, um, you know, she's leaning on Nietzsche and she's leaning on another figure called Herbert Marcuse from Frankfurt School, the, the guy who was the most friendly to psychoanalysis, right, of the Frankfurt School uh, theorists. Yet, uh, I, I, I will confess at the outset that I, I, I am going to make a strong um, argument against Brown's framing of Marcuse and Nietzsche in the way that it's done. And then I'm going to lean on um, uh, a thinker who also recently passed away, unfortunately, just this year, called Bernard Stegler, uh, who's a, he's a French philosopher, and he's written um, a trilogy of books, uh, which he, he entitles Symbolic Misery. And these are texts which are basically looking at psychopolitics of our contemporary era. And these are texts which um, I had one excerpt 
on the disaffected individual I had you read. And then we're gonna conclude with a kind of reassessment of the pitfalls of populism from a Marxist perspective. And again, we're gonna lean on uh, Losurdo to guide us there. So I thought I would begin with these three uh, quotes to situate ourselves a little bit. Um, hopefully you all can see these. Um, so one of the clearest formulations, I believe, of uh, the problem of, of negative social affects uh, today is actually this notion that Stiegler gives us, which is an, a kind of, you could think of, you know, the school of Emil Durkheim and Max Weber, they have this notion that modernity is marked by a crisis of transcendence and that crisis of transcendence leads to a feeling of disenchantment. So institutions uh, somehow fundamentally uh, uh, disenchant because they, they suffer from a crisis of legitimacy and they suffer from a crisis of legitimacy because the old transcendental modes that assured their legitimacy are now fractured. This is sort of a, a not postmodern, but this is the condition of modern life. So Stiegler sort of extends this further and we'll look at that. And the second quote here is on new forms of racism. I think that um, uh, what's novel about our current conjecture is the tendency for imminent hierarchies and imminent um, assessments, immediate assessments of um, social stratifications on class, race, gender, which, are, which derive from the brutality of the, of the world as such which means that it's a different form of essence that is ascribed to racial stratifications than the old forms, right? And this is Zupanchik who calls this um, um, uh, something biopower racism. So she's working from a psychoanalytic perspective, but commenting on the biopower theorists. So, and then since we all have a kind of general uh, commitment to left-wing emancipatory thought, I found this um, excerpt from um, um, von Mises, very interesting, who is a liberal economist. And his, his, his point here is he's speaking of Marxists, right? And it shows the kind of vulgarity of, uh, of conservative, uh, of the way that the conservative views the left-wing individuals critique of capitalism, right? So uh, that's some, some general uh, things to orientate us. So now let's turn to In the Ruins of Neoliberalism by Wendy Brown. So she, she is concerned at, with the idea of what is called in political theory, uh, the social. Right, so there is often a kind of distinction of the sphere of the social versus the sphere of the political, for example. Um, and as you'll see here in these quotes that I've identified, Wendy Brown is theorizing a new form of resentment under the era, our current era of neoliberalism as emanating from a collapse of the integrity of the social as emanating from a fragmentation of the social, right? Um, so that's at the center of her presentation. Uh, and you can see here, I'll, I'll read an excerpt. The social is where we as individuals or a nation practice or fail to practice justice, decency, civility, and care beyond the codes of market instrumentalism and familialism. So that's a key point because it's a key point because as you may or may not know from a Marxist perspective, the notion of the social or civil society, one cannot quite as easily speak of it even back in the 19th century um, as somehow beyond market instrumentalism. This um, is sort of Marx's critique of Kant's what is enlightenment, which is that the uh, preservation of a private sphere where an individual's functional role can be um, non-significant and that you can sort of have a sphere of society in which certain 
discursive antagonisms can be managed, right? This is the notion of the social, right? So the argument is that since the late 1970s, um, the policies that have been adopted by both conservative and, and liberal governing uh, coalitions in Europe and America, but even beyond, have sought to further erode the legitimacy of this sphere. So one of the phrases that we're familiar with is Margaret Thatcher's society does not exist. Uh, one is also reminded of the nice overture to this from the recent Joker film. Um, <clears throat> towards the end of the film, he sort of uh, becomes a figure who embodies um, the, the cold nihilism of, of a world of total abandonment, right? So you could think of Joker as a figure who in some sense is precisely abandoned by the social, right? Like social workers are cut. He doesn't have the care he needs. His therapy is cut. He doesn't, he doesn't, he can't have his medication, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this collapse of, of, of Thatcher's notion that there are only individuals and families is her affirmation in about 1980, 81, something like that, or the year that I was born, <laughs> in fact, um, and the year that Lacan died. The year I was born, the year Lacan died, and the year Bernie Sanders first became a politician. Um, nonetheless, you see the point here. It allows for a kind of new uh, uh, level of resentment. This is the key point. So uh, let's keep the, the emphasis on resentment in its relationship to the fragmented social, okay? And then of course, um, she's focusing in a very American-centered way, I believe, uh, by making, by marking the uniqueness of this collapse of the social around a collapse of the normative value sphere or the horizons of expectations precisely around white male entitlement, white male privilege, et cetera, right? So we can summarize some of these key themes for Brown in the following way. Um, prior to neoliberalism's assault and fragmentation of the social, one must assume that there was a type of harmony of the social, yeah? Um, and that it has now been dismantled, it's been fragmented. So therefore I wish to suggest, and I, again, we have a policy, anybody can jump in at any time. Um, is it not an implicit claim, which I think is a, 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 a wrong claim, frankly, that Fordism was a period in which the social functioned well. Um, the, I wonder if this is um, in fact the case, okay? Um, or was it not marked with its own repressions? Was it not marked with its own exclusions, right? Um, and degradations and psychic misery and so on and so on and so on. The other claim that she makes is that resentment is unique. Why? Because now uh, the new barbarians, as Stiegler calls them, the people that vote for Front National, the people that vote for, you know, Donald Trump and so on. I think it's a nice term for them, people of my own family. Huh? Um, they are uh, no longer subjects of resentment as she thinks Nietzsche claimed, because she reads Nietzsche as saying that the origin of resentment is unique because it comes from a position of weakness. And now, the subjects of resentment are actually coming from a, a, a place of a loss. So they had strength, they've lost it now. And so that's, that means for, for her, historically speaking, there's a difference there. And then I will also say that, um, as I said, vis-a-vis -vis Marxism, this is a very different conception of the civil society than Marx would, would be comfortable with. Um, so therefore, I want to ask the following questions of you. Um, in what way did the social exist prior to neoliberalism? Um, is there not a type of nostalgia for a lost fullness or a lost wholeness of the social? Um, 
yeah, like was the social not marked by class antagonisms? Of course it was, no doubt, right? We have things like civil rights movement. We have things like anti-Vietnam war protests and so on. And we see that when we go to Marcuse very clearly. Um, and so I think that, you know, for those of us committed to the Marxist tradition for however we understand that, I think it is at this point, these fault lines in Brown's argument that we can assign her uh, inheritance or influence from Michel Foucault um, in, in the sense that what Foucault is providing is a type of um, uh, conception of power which is based on norms and transgression of norms and therefore you see this idea that the social is a place for the management and the contestation of various norms, which then link to gender, race, and class. And then might we add that gender, race, class, and so on, none of those are thought to be primary. They all seem to have a kind of uh, equal relation to one another in terms of their potency, you see? And I would actually even further suggest that it may even be race, which for Brown is even more prominent than is class. And I believe this is the case because she's relying on a kind of notion that for the Fortis period, the prior period to this neoliberal period was one in which um, there was a kind of collective class stability, which is now in decline, right? This is something well known, the fact that the American worker has not received a, a real wage increase since the birth of neoliberalism is a, is a case in point here. So I want to pause there and just open it up to comments and anything. <clears throat> oh, jumping ahead of myself. Uh oh, sorry about that. Okay, please. Uh, with with the, the mention of civil society, I, I don't want to jump the gun a little bit here, but um, it reminds me, I'm seeing some like critical spaces of the left right now that really focus upon that as the limit of like the kind of like DSA post Bernie kind of project as well that um, uh, a lot of those spaces still making most of their political claims towards the like reintegration of civil society. I think referencing back to what they view at least as well as uh, Marx's critiques of the notion of civil society as, as being a limit of that. I was guess I'm wondering if, if you're looking to go in the same way as that direction or uh, uh, especially with bringing Nietzsche into it, like uh, is there a certain, I don't know, symbiosis between civil society and resentment that maybe we're getting toward or a different kind of connection? Um we'll see the connection between resentment and the collapse of the social. I'm posing the question if Brown is theorizing the social as what we have a long tradition in sociology and in Marxist thought of civil society. I mean, Alexis de Tocqueville talked about civil society and its significance. So liberal and Marxist commentators have long commented on this. And for me, I'm, 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 I'm sensitive to the Marxist analysis of civil society as sort of never possessing the beyond of market instrumentalization, you see? So therefore, like from where this can this perch of the social beyond the market instrumentalization, from when did we have that? It would be my question, right? From, from what point in history was this lost? So I'm trying to sort of problematize this sort of her reading here, um, but perhaps others that um, have a different view or, or maybe are more sympathetic to the kind of Foucauldian approach that she's bringing. Um, and I, I'm not done with this analysis because we're gonna go on to Nietzsche in a moment. Well, I think um, there's a way to combine the Foucauldian and the Marxist in this, uh, to answer this question. And to me, it's clear that she's operating within like uh, the framework of homo economicus, so the present post-Fordist man subject is the homo economicus investing in the self, etc., uh, self-responsible, uh, responsabilizing. 
Um, and so it seems like the inversion of that or the opposite of that is how she imagines this Fordist moment. Um, whether or not that can really be observed is one thing. Um, what I think that can be observed is that for a large portion of at least the uh, United States during like the post-war, I would say it only goes up to about 1962, is that it, like the uh, material conditions, like I guess what I'm saying is like wages, uh, social protections given by the government, these things were um, much more substantial than they were post-1973. And to me, I feel like the connection there is that there's a material, there are material conditions that lend themselves to the burgeoning philosophy of homo economicus that we see on the rise as the 70s unfold. Yes, thank you. But she's not quite as concerned about the material dimension. She's more concerned about the normative dimension, is my reading. She mentions it, it's a part of it, but um, it doesn't seem to be the primary uh, factor of what's at play with the crisis of resentment and with affective politics. Because what she's building up to is a sort of thesis, which is ultimately in support of, um, of Nietzsche and Marcuse, right? Um, which we'll get to in a moment. But I believe that the best way to read it is that this crisis of the social is sort of the primary, you know, to me, She's not saying that the primary thing is this sort of material issue of wages. It's not really a question of labor for her, right? That's in the background. It's there, but it's not a primary, right? Right. So, um, so uh, the social uh, changed after the Second World War when intelligence and understanding and knowledge became very important. Thus, in Belgium, a law was produced uh, by the Christian party and the socialists, whereby everybody would get a grant to go to the university. I was the oldest of 10 children of a small farm and my total expense, including books and food was paid by that program. So the dimension, the understanding that advanced capitalism requires knowledge changed the dynamics of the social. Mm. That's helpful. Uh -huh. I appreciate that. That's, that's interesting, yeah. Other thoughts? Well, look, I'll just jump in if I may. Um, the, the thing that, I, Daniel, I the thing that you haven't emphasized so far, at least, is the way Wendy Brown links society to democracy. Yeah. And it's not as if she's claiming that uh, society was ever um, present in some idealized form. But what she is arguing, or at least what we might agree on by way of proceeding for the moment, is that the kinds of processes she's been talking about uh, occurring in the last 20 to 30 years have intensified the extent to which society and the social has been eviscerated. Um, and that carries significant implications for what we might call uh, expansive democratic, uh, the realization of expansive democratic. Uh, 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 realities. Let, let me stop there. No, you're, you're right. I was more focusing on the way that the collapse of the social or of its uh, legitimacy, of its uh, viability for citizens, uh, permits uh, a spirit of anti-democratic participation in society, right? So people still live in society, but they're, they're somehow unbounded from the prior social contracts. So I think that there may be a way in which there's a kind of latent social contractarian way to read this and that there is a kind of shift through the privatization of Thatcher and Reagan, right, which then was adopted by Clinton and third wave politics and continued all the way up through 2008 and now even continues now with no band-aids, right, with no readjustments. So um, 
that's a, a, a extraordinarily momentous and destructive movement, right? What I'm throwing into question is a more philosophical question around uh, the causality of that deterioration vis-a-vis -vis resentment politics. Uh, so I'm sort of putting the cart before the horse because we need to get to Nietzsche. <laughs> and I think maybe some of these things might come back maybe full circle. Other comments though, these have been wonderful points. Um, Daniel, all Hi. right. So Robert Putnam, a sociologist, yep. wrote the book Bowling Alone. Yes. Um, he's written a new book. I think it's called The Upswing. And mm -hmm. I, am, I haven't read it, but it's, uh, I'd, I'd be curious to read it in terms of, the, of th this, you know, theorizing the concept of the social. He's just, he's just, I think he's making the basic argument that America at one point um, like had, uh, was more characterized by like a, a me culture. Then it go, it, there's this period that he says there is more like, uh, like could be characterized as a we culture. And then it goes back to a very individualistic culture characteristic of neoliberal, neoliberalism. So I wonder if, uh, without being able to answer the question, like if his insights would provide any, uh, anything useful. I'm, I'm very familiar with Bowling Alone. I read that as an undergraduate and then I'm familiar with his book on religion, which was very interesting, uh, where he shows that religious communities sort of maintained that Tocquevelian commitment to the civil, civil society. I mean, obviously they Tocqueville is the central figure of American civil society as a foreigner, as a Frenchman, witnessing the sort of radical power of American civil society. And as a liberal, he very much is congratulatory of, over this, right? So in that sense, if we take seriously that liberal claim about this importance of civil society to the maintenance of, of American democracy or any democracy, one can see how tragic it is, especially in America, which prides itself on a vibrant civil society to lose it, right? Um, and I think that Putnam is, is um, no Marxist by, <laughs> by any means. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that uh, what he's trying to do is find bright spots, right, on the horizon, you know? So I think that might be an interesting way, but I'm, I am bringing my own um, commitments here, right? My own, my own my critical point of view. Mm -hmm. um, so let us, uh, let us look at how Nietzsche is presented by Brown. So she says very little about Nietzsche, but she frames Nietzsche in a way which I find um, problematic. She says, quote, uh, Nietzsche's profound account of nihilism was limited by his preoccupation with God and morality as they were being challenged by science and reason. Nietzsche's account of nihilism in which first God and then man is toppled as foundational sources of truth and morality is inadequate to our present. Okay, so I think we can all agree that it's inadequate. But what I wanna point out is, is Nietzsche's account of resentment really about Christianity? And I wish to say to you tonight that it's not. So she presents these, the following oppositions on Nietzsche. Nietzsche is a critic of uh, Christianity from which the main engine of nihilism, and what is nihilism for Nietzsche? The, the godfather of nihilism, Oh, hi, this is my hi. daughter, Eva. She wanted to make a cameo, so this, she'll be back later. Um, right as I get the most excited talking about Nietzsche. Um, the godfather of, of, of um, Resentiment is actually Socrates for Nietzsche. Nietzsche's first serious book was on Socrates. And uh, it's not exactly Jesus Christ who was the godfather of nihilism. And as you, as you know from genealogy of, mor of morals, Nietzsche makes the claim that nihilism is fundamentally linked to the introduction by a plebeian class of demands for equality, first and foremost, yeah? So it is the problem of egalitarianism, which is at the origin of any development of, or demands for egalitarianism. Um, so that's central. Uh, Resentiment is born from weakness, according to Brown, uh, well, according to Brown's reading of Nietzsche, which she then says is then linked to a loss of privilege and entitlement. This is the key point I wish to make, which is that 
uh, for Nietzsche in a post-French revolutionary period, Nietzsche lived in Germany as a young man as the 1848 worker uprisings occurred where Marx penned the Communist Manifesto. He then was um, very much moved in a negative way by the Paris Commune uprising of 1871. Um, he wrote a letter to a friend where he confessed this is one of the most tragic days of my life uh, to see what the communists have been doing on the streets of Paris. So um, uh, I wish to frame the question between resentment as class struggle within capitalism versus resentment as a kind of quasi-religious, because if we leave it there, then the issue becomes one of morals. And we leave it there, then it becomes discursive. As we have a different understanding of it, of its function. Um, okay, so those are some key points. Now, this is sort of section two of our, of our talk tonight. And I, I'll read this following point here. It says, so what happens when you theorize resentment in a long durée from the 19th century to the present and you place class struggle, not a genealogical kind of religion and Christianity at the origin? This is the project that I've been interested in undertaking since I've engaged with Los Sordo's aristocratic rebel, which is a complete uh, new reappraisal of Nietzsche. And he's giving us four general new ways to read the contributions of Friedrich Nietzsche. First is that uh, the idea of Nietzsche as a kind of philologist interested in locating nihilism and resentment in some ancient time is not a fair account when one actually understands the intricacies of his writings and of his um, ideology, right? He's extremely presentist in, in, in he even says that it was the Paris Commune which turned him into a genealogist because he wanted to find the source of resentment of the communards located within history, right? So they were modern so Socratic figures. The, the communards in Paris were contemporary uh, disciples of a tradition that was started by Socrates, continued on with Christianity and Judaism, found its uh, way through Descartes and Rousseau and Produn and Marx. But Marx is sort of an exception and a challenge because Marx is not a socialist, he's a communist. So in that sense, Marx becomes very close to Nietzsche. The problem is socialism and its infestation within liberalism is the issue for Nietzsche. Liberalism must expunge the socialist influence. The key political concept for Nietzsche, the most refined idea of the Ubermensch of uh, um, Zarathustra, is to create the conditions for a world in which the preservation of leisure time for an aesthetic class is enacted, right? Um, this is a, a, a Prussian, otium et bellum is a Prussian military slogan. Nietzsche was conscripted uh, or willingly served to fight the, in the Franco-Prussian War of 1873. So um, this is very central to place these things. Uh, uh, and it's also very central to not uh, read Nietzsche's contribution if you are in any way committed to the left or any way committed to Marxism uh, so uh, religiously or nor normative based. In my, and this is my uh, strong opinion here. So um, <clears throat> in fact, Lucero shows us that Nietzsche was a huge proponent of Christianity. He was a huge proponent of Christianity in certain forms. If Christianity could retain aristocratic divisions and hierarchy of rank order, it was actually better than socialism. Socialism was a problem because socialism allowed for the expression of new needs, of new desires, of a class which must remain in uh, labor for the surplus extraction for those elite overmen who can produce culture. This is of central importance. It is the case for Nietzsche that slave society, feudal and capitalist are in essence the same thing. Um, this is why Nietzsche was a huge proponent of the South during the Civil War, right? 
He saw this as a very momentous event. Um, even though uh, his racism is different than the kind of vulgar racism that we see with something like Ku Klux Klan or alt-right, because his racism is um, not tied to biological essence, it's tied to uh, struggle in the present. So his vision for an ideal society would be one in which imminent struggle can determine uh, rank order, right? So that the uh, Chandala class or the slave class, it's, it's ne necessary to have forms of slavery for Nietzsche, uh, would be um, imminently determined, not based on some kind of vulgar biological essence. You see the point, this is his big debate with Wagner, right? This is why uh, when you look at Nietzsche's influence on Nazism, uh, it was, he would be a critic of Nazis, right? He, there was a sort of split there, right? Um, Nietzsche was okay with Jews of finance if they could prove their valor and their strength and so on, for example, right? <clears throat> so uh, this is Los Sordo here. Religion is a key to the maintenance of aristocratic order. I'll let you read this uh, passage because um, uh, in the Opium Wars, uh, um, that the European colonial powers fought in China. Uh, Nietzsche was a, a fond admirer of the way in which um, Christian ideology was used as a, as, a, as a mode of victory within that struggle. So anytime anybody tells you that Nietzsche is a grand critic of Christianity, I think you should really uh, think twice about, about such, a, such a claim. And then I'll... Also note that uh, the, the, the true uh, uh, genealogy of resentment should be read uh, uh, imminent to the struggles of his time, right? The, the, the moral spider, the, 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 the true uh, problem starter was Rousseau. You have to understand that Germany was occupied by France in the Napoleonic invasions. Yeah? And it was the Rousseauist impulse of egalitarianism, which Nietzsche perceived as a total assault on the German spirit, right? So any instantiation or expression of Rousseauism uh, was on par with so so Socrates as such. So by no means was uh, Socrates some timeless other figure. Well, there were real Socratic instantiations in his time, which propelled his thought, you see. Um, the other thing that we should note with Losurdo is that uh, liberalism uh, was also very much uh, the cauldron of ideas from which Nietzsche pulled from. And that a lot of people, I think, are not quite as aware of the spectrum of liberal thought as it pertains to critiques of socialism and as it pertains to critiques uh, or support of colonialism and support of slave systems. So when reading the aristocratic rebel, one is quite struck um, by that interplay and by the similarity that a figure like Alexis de Tocqueville would have with Nietzsche on the question of colonialism, because the issue with colonialism for both Tocqueville and Nietzsche was the issue that the working classes in Europe and the degradation that they were undergoing presented a crisis, yes, of nihilism, of values and so on, but of purpose. So sending these boys off to Africa and Indochina to fight would imbue them with a new spirit. This was something which was held by Mill, the great liberal Mill, right? This was something which was held by de Tocqueville and Nietzsche alike, right? Was very fond of one another's ideas in these in these, uh, in these ways. So uh, that's my little uh, hot and heavy Nietzschean interlude. Uh, any questions before we move to Marcuse? I I, I did uh, include like a quite long excerpt, which gets into a really interesting uh, contrast between Marx and Nietzsche on ideology from Aristocratic Rebel. Um, I don't know if anybody got a chance to look at it or if anybody has thoughts on this in general, because I think you see the point I'm trying to make, I hope. 
which is that we should be very careful about how we place the crisis of values when the crisis of values for Nietzsche were from the get-go tied into a crisis brought on by the introduction of the Jacobin egalitarian project and Rousseauism, which supported it, and then which was gaining intensity after 1848 and 1871, right? So um, I'll stop there. Now you're never gonna look at Nietzsche again, right? Is, this, is he done for you now? Is it all over? Uh, I, I, I do believe that this reading is um, uh, sobering, uh, in my opinion, uh, when thinking about this figure. And I think it's also important to note that the investment that philosophers have in Nietzsche is a very dear investment. Um, because there is a certain view, which is figures who flirted with fascism, such as Heidegger, signing his letters, Hail Hitler, for a time being, for example, uh, can still, we can still extract a type, a type of left-wing uh, uh, emancipatory Heidegger, right? And the same obviously goes with Nietzsche. Like there's a new uh, article which argues that Walter Kaufman, the translator of Nietzsche, has made Nietzsche into a liberal for Americans, yeah? Um, and so, so therefore there's a kind of jouissance that liberal philosophers have with Nietzsche. So when I present this argument to them, they do not want to hear it. It's, they don't have anything to say, but they definitely don't want to hear it, right? Okay. <clears throat> okay. So repressive desublimation sounds like one of those academic terms which the right wing will make fun of us for for ages and ages to come. Um, however, my, my, my point for you now is just to highlight some passages where this concept is introduced in One Dimensional Man, his Marcuse's text. And I'm doing this because Brown really leans on Marcuse and this is an important concept for us to get a, a grasp on affect theory and so on. Um, because he's talking about it in the context of Hegel's unhappy consciousness, right? And he's talking about uh, the idea of negation and negativity, right? And so he's talking about the way in which modern industrial society has lost a certain sphere of transcendence, which would allow individuals um, to effectively instantiate a sublimation, right? And a sublimation is a kind of aesthetic concept, right? An aesthetic concept which has to do, it's, but it's also a question for Freud and civilization is discontents of a question of labor, right? So the basic idea of Freud of sublimation in that text is that, um, you know, uh, in modern life, man works uh, and toils eight hours a day, whatever, maybe more, maybe less. As sublimation becomes a type of um, uh, a way of, of, of processing, of, of, of not allowing for the um, degradations to, to, um, situ to, fix, to fixate themselves libidinally. So sublimation has to do with a kind of release, which is uh, not of a repressive nature, right? So there's something quite liberatory about it. And so for Marcuse, in the realm of aesthetics, uh, uh, sublimation is something which you find in tragedy, which is something you find in the kind of um, high culture, low culture distinction, which we're probably all familiar with. If you took an art history class, you're familiar with that. It is this um, end of tragedy, this conflation, this kind of um, uh, constriction um, on the sphere of transcendence that creates what he calls a kind of negative sublimation, right? Um, and so, you know, in that sense, um, uh, it creates a number of, of issues. So these, these passages will help us understand uh, uh, what this problem is all about. So he says here that um, it has to do with a, a reconstitution of the drives 
of man within modern the modern world, right? There's no longer this um, um, release of repression. There is a kind of sublimation, which still retains repression, basically, is a way to think about repressive desublimation. And here's a very significant passage. He says, the organism is thus being preconditioned for the spontaneous acceptance of what is offered, inasmuch as the greater liberty involves a contraction rather than extension and development of instinctual needs. It works for rather than against the status quo of general repression. One might speak of institutionalized desublimation. The latter appears to be a vital factor in the making of the authoritarian personality of our time, right? So he uses a number of examples of, uh, of plays, of pieces of artwork, of, of the way in which um, they, uh, like, he, he, he says, for example, the figure of the beatnik um, presents the mold of a liberatory potential. But when one actually inhabits this commodified idea of the rebel, like Jack Kerouac and all of that, um, it does not produce a sublimation for the subject that is channeling it, so on. And so that failure of aesthetic sublimation, which was successful in a prior era, has now lost its efficacy. Okay, it's a very complex thing. I mean, I'm sort of, I hope that this is clear to you or, or and anybody can jump in at any point, of course. So he says here, this is an important one. Uh, assuming that the, the destruction instinct or the death drive, death instinct, of course, Marcuse is relying on a very naturalized conception. This is not a Lacanian conception of the signifier and of, um, of that is centering language. Okay, so he says, as a large component of the energy which feeds the technical conquest of man and nature, it seems that society's growing capacity to manipulate technical progress also increases its capacity to manipulate and control this instinct. Right, so this technological incursion, this is important when we get to Stiegler, the level of drives, okay? Uh, social cohesion would be strengthened at the deepest instinctual roots. The supreme risk and even the fact of war would meet not only with helpless acceptance, but also with instinctual approval on the part of the victims. So it's a, so you see the point, right? Which is a kind of um, um, new reality principle. Right? So Marcuse will actually formulate his idea of revolt, uh, which is why he was the godfather of the 60s, intellectual godfather of the 60s generation, against reason, against reason. It's a very unfreudian position, right? Um, against the reality principle, right? Because um, anyways, he would, he would introduce a supplemental notion to reality principle and what he called performance principle. And so he would take the Freudian apparatus and introduce all of these kind of new terms, right? So some idiosyncratic approach, but nonetheless very influential, right? Um, here's what Brown says. Um, today, free, stupid, manipulable, absorbed by, if not addicted to trivial stimuli and gratifications, the subject of repressive desublimation in advanced capitalist society is not just libidinally unbound, released to enjoy more pleasure, but they are also released from more general expectations of social conscience and social comprehension. This re release is amplified by the neoliberal assault on the social and attack on intellectual knowledge, as well as by the depression of conscience fostered by nihilism. So I think that's actually a very strong use of Marcuse there. I, I wonder if you all agree. I think that that makes sense, right? You sort of have this idea of um, some different though, which is from Marcuse, uh, the conformism of reason, right? What is presented as entering into the norm was the site of repression. Now, because the uh, deterioration of the normative efficacy has so uh, modified in the contemporary period, you have an even greater loosening of the drives and is no longer that the reality principle is necessarily uh, that which is repressive. You see the distinction there? 
because of the collapse of the norms, you see? So it's sort of, she's taking a little bit of Marcuse, but adding her own argument on the collapse of the social. Um, <clears throat> here's what else she says. For Marcuse, autonomy declines when comprehension declines, okay? Um, and it says, comprehension declines when it is not required for survival and when the unemancipated subject is steeped in capitalist commodity pleasure and stimuli. Um, so the notion there is negative desublimation is that um, we don't actually, Judith Butler talks about this a lot too, and I think she's right, right? Which is that our age, com contemporary era is marked by an absence of liberatory desire. I mean, it's, it's very true. I mean, when was the last time you heard somebody talk about uh, the reinvention of the human being, right? Or when was the last time you heard somebody talk about, we're gonna work on a project of liberation in a universal sense. There used to be organizations, political organizations, which said, we wanna concoct a new man and a new woman, right? Through politics. Nobody talks about like that anymore, right? So you see the distinction there, yeah? Um, and then here's the point that I think is slightly problematic though. She says, the problem is, is that late capitalist desublimation relaxes demands against the drives or instincts, all the while not freeing the subject for self-direction and self-autonomy and comprehension. It's not necessary. You can sort of enjoy and be stupid, right? It's, it's totally permissible, right? There is no norm that would challenge either of those injunctions, right? This is like Alain Badiou's notion of democratic materialism. Right? There are only bodies in language. There's no need for a reason. There's no need for ideas, right? Um, what I wanna point attention to and which I think Stiegler helps us with is the notion of relaxation of drives. I don't know, I don't know what that means or demand to drive. Maybe some of our psychoanal psychoanalysts could help us with this distinction, but... So let's summarize here. Number one, Marcuse identifies reason with repression, opposite from Freud, I think, which is desire is a kind of, of motive. Reason as desire is motive, right? So there's no Freudian politics that would be opposed to reason or sort of anti-rationalist. And I think this is a problem with Marcuse's project, which is it becomes privileging aesthetics, maybe privileging myth too much over reason. That's a whole other point. Um, and then here's a summary of Eros and Civilization, if you haven't read it. Um, the notion that makes Marcuse a hippie is the idea that there exists a kind of naturalist pleasure principle, which is in abeyance, right? And that through revolt, we can achieve some kind of touch of the, it's quite nice, you know, if you think about it, like kind of sublime, you know, let's all do a big bonfire in the woods and sort of realize, you think like acid communism is a kind of variant of this notion of missing pleasure principle. And maybe, I hope he's right, actually. I would not mind such a project, especially because nobody proposes them today. Um, okay, and then here I've, I've made the point about drives because Stiegler is gonna give us a different view on the way that late capitalism relates to the drives. Um, and then of course, uh, apropos nihilism, yeah, what makes it post Nietzschean in her view is that the resentment is not converted into mor morality. So there's not a sublimation of morals here from the resentment, right? Th there's a defectiveness there, right? Um, and this actually leads her to make really nice points, I think, which is that basically man, humanity today has no project other than a project of permanent revenge, right? And, and what is produced is an affect, affective condition just run amok, right? I think this notion actually is very telling when one looks at the Trump coalition at this precise moment that we're meeting, right? Um, what else is there other than revenge that's at play? I mean, it's the primary thing, right? Um, okay, so let's pause. And before we turn to Stiegler, let's open it up to any questions or comments. Uh, I was thinking a little bit how Brown using Marcusa in that uh, repressive desublimation, but the, the contemporary stage, the, the lack of necessity of comprehension and, and just sort of a, um, that overlap of non-comprehension enjoyment. It seemed to me like that was maybe overlapping a little bit with, um, if you're familiar with Alfie Bone at all, he does some like Marxist Lacanian stuff on video games. 
Yeah. Uh, I think what he sometimes refers to like um, a, a certain like pre oedipal subjectivity that's produced in like the the generalized like video game subjectivity somewhat, where it's just like the like um, like gamified mechanical like pushing of buttons and receiving responses like without having to have like a comprehension towards what even is occurring within the stage. Sure, that's helpful. I, I, I think, again, I don't mean to uh, go too hard on Brown. She's a brilliant theoretician, please. I mean, of course, I just wanted to problematize a few things, right? And I think the way she incorporates Marcuse and Nietzsche kind of works, but the other parts don't, right? Um, so, okay, Bernard Stiegler. Again, the Symbolic Misery series, you can see the image of, uh, is brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. And if you look at this book here, which is called The Lost Spirit of Capitalism, uh, which is uh, uh, a part of this uh, multi-volume series, uh, half of the book is a critique of Marcuse. Okay, so for those of you that really like Marcuse or really want to find a way to discover why he's wrong, I think Bernard Stiegler gives us the sort of best indication in my opinion. So let me just sort of some axiomatic points for Stiegler of our contemporary conjecture. So he talks a lot about how in our contemporary conjecture, um, we have a loss of the super ego entirely. He also talks about how desire is absent today as a result of algorithmic over control and so on. So there's a kind of um, collapse of desire as understood in the traditional sense in which that which is beyond calculation, right? So there's a kind of um, incapacity, which is why when he says lost spirit of capitalism, what he's really saying there is that in order for uh, it's not exactly a communist revolutionary kind of thinker, okay? He actually has the general argument, if I could sort of put it in a clear sense, that we need to return to a slightly more stable version of capitalism in order to more properly negate it. Because in his view, we are too affectively disoriented now in neoliberal order to actually do anything, right? So. Maybe that's like um, an unappealing proposal for those of you that are more maybe convinced of a more revolutionary uh, approach, uh, but that's how I read his general politics, okay? Um, so, and he calls our era the reign of the drives. And, and this, this is why he, he, he refers to the reign of the drives as having such primacy. And I'm gonna get into a, in a moment why they have such primacy over social life, okay? Um, so he says, quote, uh, for beings without desire find their drives loosened and set free. Society is no longer able to contain such beings through repressive measures, nor can it contain the regression that unleashes these drives. So that's a very important point there. The whole apparatus of Marcuse, of authoritarian pers personality, of the centrality of repression is, is no longer uh, have efficacy, okay? Um, <clears throat> this is another beautiful point he makes, which is we have a crisis in the Freudian distinction between primary and secondary narcissism. And there is a kind of fundamental stunting of what we can in general terms call the development of self-love, right? So it's a, it's a beautiful way to think about the notion that Freud will talk about when he makes his turn to group psychology, that even for Freud, never, we never speak of the individual I as a kind of monad, right? The I is always already incorporated in, into a group, right? And all, all of the Wilhelm Reich left-wing Freudians will really follow that very far. And they'll go so far as to say the origin of social repression is social, it's not psychical, right? So um, Simon Don, the French philosopher, whose idea of individuation, which also is very the Spinozistic kind of notion, is very important to Stiegler here. So he takes a psychoanalytic and a Simondonian approach to present this notion of a new form of narcissism, a new crisis of narcissism. Um, 
a new crisis of narcissism, which is somehow preventing humanity from forming community or from, from having um, healthy I-we relations, right? So there's a kind of fundamental stunting. And for him, his main contribution as a philosopher comes from the way he reads techne in Heidegger. That's his main contribution. So for him, he's a philosopher of technology primarily. And so he's gonna make a point that what he calls retentional apparatuses in late capitalism have, are at the core of this aesthetic stunting, right? Which is why he's very interested in sublimation as an aesthetic problem, right? Um, so therefore society, the problem is that we can no longer love ourselves, right? Which I think is a very nice accessible way to describe the problem of our world, right? Um, so he says, post 70s capitalism, the self increasingly fails to form an interior self love and therefore attempts to form um, communities are therefore stunted. And this actually introduces the problem of the social and of civil society and Putnam and all of that, right? Um, and this is a very striking uh, point because it links to his thesis of the liquidation of desire, right? Um, so uh, a world a world in which desire is no longer operative is a world that can no longer love itself, right? Um, so I wanna lay out a few very clear solutions that I believe Bernard Stegler is giving us uh, uh, in general, okay? From, from what I've read of his, of his work in this area. And he's written widely on many, many different topics. Um, he gives a name to the, um, the um, right populist cohort. He calls them the new barbarians. And, and he refers to them as affective victims, which I think is an interesting way to theorize them. Um, and it makes this point that um, the issue is one of political love, right? That, that we must reintroduce this kind of Aristotelian notion of philia, right? Of a civic love, a social love. And he advocates a kind of cross-partisan dialogue, right? And I think for a lot of Marxist thinkers who are very kind of, you know, brazen, this is sort of uh, maybe naive. I don't know what you think of it. Um, number two, uh, it makes this argument around technology and algorithmic systems of control. You could think social media, but many others of a theory of, of non-identification, which is something I've written about. And it's, I think, quite interesting. And then he has this notion of a, of, a, of a movement from the reign of drives to the play of drives. Good night, good night. Um, so this kind of, um, kind of Agambenian notion of, of play and the innocence um, as, a, as a new theory of sublimation, right? So these are some general things if you want to do more research on, on Siegler. Um, is, is, a, is a fascinating philosopher. And unfortunately he's died uh, just a few months ago, um, uh, but he's a brilliant, brilliant uh, figure. And I think what, what I like about including him here is you know, he leaves some of the missing things of Marcuse. Because remember I said at the beginning, part of the problem of our world is we rely on thinkers who existed in a different era than we do now, right? Stiegler is an incredibly good thinker of the, of the contemporary, so. <clears throat> so let me just stop there and see if there's any comments or questions on, on, um, on some of this. Um, I think our objective here, right, because next week we're going to look at Lacan and affect theory. We're going to get a little more um, theoretically technical. But tonight we wanted to kind of keep it at this high level, you know, sociopolitical kind of, kind of analysis, right? Um, Daniel, I'm kind of interested in how you see the difference between what Stiegler is arguing and what Wendy Brown is arguing about um, like kind of a return to a, a previous stage when things were more stabilized or when right. we could uh, be, you know, more rational or more able to judge. And because um, the more I read Stiegler, the more I think, I mean, I, I understand the idea of individuation of what he's talking about, but is that not also hearkening back to a principle of individualism in a way or um, 
or or as that being the place where the unique comes from or where the difference um, initiates itself. Um, and so it, it kind of seems again, like a move that is typical of um, academics who are not Marxist. Um, there's a trust in this individual or like something that if, if we just help the individual out, it will figure out a way, you know, like, uh, am I misreading him or, I guess I just want to hear like your, your, the difference you see between him and Wendy Brown in, in that respect. You know, to be honest, I don't think that there's much. I don't think that there's much. I think that Brown is coming from a very unique American academic perspective, which is why she's focusing so much on race and so on, and the kind of American civil society. Stiegler is slightly more global in his um, reading. He's, he's now, uh, in his later work, he's turned to questions of ecology. Um, and he is a true um, uh, autodidact theoretician. I mean, he became a philosopher in prison and um, uh, goes in so many different directions. I mean, he has works that are completely trying to re-theorize the Freudian death drive through neg entropy and like getting into the science of entropy, right? So he goes in very different directions. He's, um, he is a, a thinker of aesthetic, of aesthetics and of technology primarily, right? So I think there's something interesting about the sphere of the social for Brown and for Stiegler, which is reliant on aesthetics, I think, is one of my big kind of takeaways from a lot of this reading, right? Because um, part of the causality of this affective crisis, um, if we accept Brown's argument, um, you know, is that it is an aesthetic, that sort of, or maybe the way in which it is best addressed is through aesthetics, if we want to rationally, philosophically address it and so on. I don't know if you agree with that contention. Um, but I guess to answer your question, maybe they are fairly close, you know, in their, um, where I think he's different is his correctives on Marcuse um, around, around the way in which drives uh, function and the relationship between um, some more theoretic, finer theoretical points. If I can just add on to that, um... Wendy Brown gave a talk, I believe it was in early 2018, called Neoliberalism Scorpion Tail at UC Berkeley, uh, in which she basically, it was, it was a launching pad for her latest book. So it's kind of part of the chapters that we had reread, but her idea was essentially very similar to Stiegler's around philia and around this idea that if we did not teach the scorpion, and this was the conclusion of her talk, at least as I remember it now, if you don't teach the scorpion, to kind of value a, a civic love again, uh, it will sting itself. So, so it is very similar, I think, in that way. So, right, yeah. right, right. Yeah, I mean, I, somebody told me a story that uh, Adorno was at the funeral of Horkheimer, or Horkheimer was at the funeral of Adorno, and the eulogy on the reflection of where we went wrong and the Frankfurt School project was that we focus too much on aesthetics. I've always liked that story. It's kind of interesting from a Marxist, you know, because they are very committed Marxists, yeah? So I do, I do think in contemporary theory, there is a kind of um, siloization of Marxist philosophers against aesthetics in some ways, right? Or there's a certain sense in which the proposals of Brown and Stiegler are kind of liberal. Right? and this is a problem, or post-structuralism is liberal, right? That's a problem, right? Um, so I think in, in our final section for tonight, when we look at Losurdo on populism, maybe I think some of these things might kind of come into a little more clarity because he's bringing a very strong um, Marxist kind of orientation. Any other comments before I move to, to that? Yeah, look, if I can... Um... Please intervene with um, a question. So trying to open this up a little bit more. Uh, Daniel, I thought that, you know, you very briefly uh, characterized Freud on sublimation. I thought 
it was a good, if uh, very brief, account of uh, a release not of a repressive nature. And that's clearly the case, that uh, sublimation uh, proceeds without any resistance. And that's, that's why it is unique amongst all the defense mechanisms. Yeah. Um, in Brown, at least some of the time, I just wonder if she isn't collapsing sublimation into a form of repression. And I, I put that as a question because I'm, I'm still trying to sort my way through that. Um, and hence the desublimation argument takes on this aspect of the, the outflow of affect and aggressivity, et cetera, untamed by either repression or any other of defences or by sublimation. Um, is there a kind of slide there, perhaps? There's a, um, a very nice point, you know, um, at the Lacanian Forum here in Washington, D.C., I recently gave a uh, presentation because, you know, for Jack Lacan in his later work, um, he makes a bold statement, basically, which is that in the contemporary era, there is no more sublimation as we used to know it. Right. And I was very struck by that claim, because if you get um, affected to look on, it's always through the ethics seminar, or at least it was for me. And in the ethics seminar, you have these kind of heroic examples of sublimation with Antigone. Right. Um, um, so what is it then about late capitalism that forecloses sublimation? It's, is it an aesthetic issue? Right. Um, very interesting thing. I don't, I don't know if tonight we can delve into this is something of, of real, speaking of working group and research, this is a major area of interest for me personally. And I think this is something we should sort of continue as we proceed to examine, right? But I think you're right. I, I, I invite others, but I think that she's saying that uh, something similar to what Lacan is saying around desublimate. We don't have sublimate, we have desublimation, right? And the repressive thing is not, she doesn't include repressive because we're in a post-repressive society, right? Mm -hmm. But what I'm concerned about, and maybe somebody could help us here is what does she mean by relaxes demands against the drives? I'm actually, I confess, I'm a slightly confused about that point. Maybe Wilfred, you could help us understand the distinction in psychoanalysis between drive and demand. Drive would be uh, uh, the energy that uh, comes. <clears throat> demand is a first expression of uh, the energy. So you are hungry, the child wants to eat, uh, but uh, in a demand, it wants, it asks the mother, not for a regular bread, but for, in Belgium, a Sunday bread. That means a, a white bread. Uh, so the demand, is a request for an object of need. That one does not need, but that one asks to see if one is loved by the authority. Okay. Mm. Can I? Please, Michelle, yeah. Um, I just wanted to go back to this, to the discussion of sublimation initially because there was something that wasn't mentioned that I think is important that sublimation is certainly not repressive and it certainly is a release but it's not any kind of release right it's and it's not just like artistic release it can be artistic but I think for Freud and, and for Lacan definitely sublimation is a socially constructive release right so and I, I think that it's that social that socially constructive element I mean at least that's how I I think of um, sublimation, that it has to build something that's socially acceptable, right? It doesn't mean that we have to agree with it as leftists, right? It could be maybe socially constructive in a, in a bad way. Um, like I don't think it has that political dimension necessarily, but it 
it acknowledges and builds on the social. So I think that when Brown and maybe also Stiegler, I'm not sure, um, is saying that, you know, this, this quote that, that you have up, right, uh, as late capitalist desublimation relaxes demands against the instincts um, that sublimation is a demand, it, it does demand something of the instincts, it, 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 it creates a particular pathway for them, right? It's not just release, it's not aggression, sublimation is not just aggression, right? Or it's not just sexual release, it's, it's, it, it is a particular kind of pathway that could be painful and that could require work and focus, right? To get, I think anyone who's taken a long writing project um, knows that, right? That, that, that can take a certain kind of, um, um, maybe not repressive, but a certain kind of limitation or boundedness, a binding of, of the energy, right? So I think what Brown is saying is that there's not, it, that binding of the drives, that binding of the, of, of the drives is not taking place anymore. And therefore that sublimation, which is socially constructive, right? Yeah. Can take place. So it's the social aspect of the, of the redirection of the drives that's missing. It, yeah. Does that make sense? <laughs> oh no, that's a brilliant, brilliant okay. intervention. No, no, no. But Marcuse is saying something different, which is that the old order, right? Um, at a certain point in modernity, sublimation still had a kind of negativity associated with it, right? So it wasn't that the norm in some kind of conformist sense was what was being sublimated. I think actually um, repressive desublimation is that, right? So it's like a kind of social valorization of liberation through, I don't know, the, the sense in which the Iraq war is truly an effort in freedom, right? right? Uh, for example. And, um, and there, thank you very much for emphasizing that um, beyond just the aesthetic for sublimation, right? I fully agree. I mean, for Lacan, it's the elevation of the object to the dignity of the thing, right? So it's a kind of implicit definition that even there, it's not exactly something which is um, socially valorized, yes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the heroes of sublimation are social conformists. Often they're not, right? Often they're revolutionaries and libertines and so on, so. I would maybe say it's creative rather than necessarily aesthetic. Maybe. Okay, fair enough, fair enough, yeah. Thank you. And Wilfred, thank you for your uh, def definition of demand and drive. That, that is an important distinction. Mm -hmm. So I think we're a little bit clearer now about this for Brown. Um, how are we doing on time? Does anybody know what time it is right now? I have full screen on, let's see. 22 past eight. Okay, okay. So we're doing pretty well. Um, if I may, I wanted to move to, because the, the title for tonight was on populism, right? So I took an excerpt from Lucerto's really interesting book on the history of class struggle. I don't know if anyone's read that book or familiar with it, but I took, um, I think it's chapter 13 on, on his analysis of contemporary populism, but also populism even, because um, he reads people like Produn as populists, right? And Simone Weil as a populist, right? And Hart and Negri as populists, right? So he has a kind of expansive definition of what constitutes populism, which I find kind of refreshing. And he gives us three forms of populism. Um, and I think here we could even present a kind of provisional definition of populism, which is that populism conceives of class struggle, not as the normal state of social life, as would a Marxist, but as an exceptional moment happening at a morally privileged moment. Um, and here's a nice uh, point here, which is the idea of populism, one of the kind of through lines is that um, the salt of the earth are elevated as possessing a kind of moral excellence, right? So what I find interesting about this is that all of the things we've talked about so far of the demolition of the social and the incapacity of morality and so on, right? This new form of nihilism, right? Is it not the case actually that right and left populism 
are actually kind of in their own ways, highly moralistic phenomenon. That's a kind of proposal I think we could present from the Lacerda reading. I wonder if you agree. And here he's critiquing Simone Veil's understanding of class struggle, which give a lot of excerpts from her work where what was at issue, and this was similar also to a figure like Gandhi, was those that undergo the most suffering kind of qua suffering as an end in itself are the ones that um, uh, in the context of the struggle are the site of the contradiction, right? And so it becomes a kind of, um, I don't know, almost like a vulgar empiricism is at play with populism in a certain way. Um, the, so type number one that he identifies is populism as proposing a loss of original fullness. And I like this because isn't this exactly what we are confounded by with Stiegler and Brown around Fordism and neoliberalism? Isn't this notion exactly one of the issues on the left today, which is from what fullness have we lost, right? Or not? I think there's a certain tendency for a Marxist author to say, well, you've never had fullness. <laughs> you know, sort of you're marked by class throughout, you see? Um, so uh, then here, resentment of the populist, this is very important. I think if you, if you live on Twitter, left-wing Twitter, you'll see this very clearly. Resentment is driven by a sense of lost wholeness, right? So quote, the more large scale industry subjects agricultural sectors to its control and destroys artists. This is, this is Marx talking about the condition of the lumpen proletariat around 1848, okay? So what Lozoda is saying here is that Marx fully understood that uh, sympathetic uh, socialists like Produn and anarchists um, and LaSalle and other social democrats would um, opine nostalgically for this prior lifestyle that feudalism offered, that somehow the feudal social contract was more harmonious than this new industrial capitalist social contract, which is much more alienating, right? And Lucerto wants to suggest that Marx um, was, was completely antithetical to this, right? The second type he identifies as what he says, transfiguration of victims of the present as embodying moral excellence, right? So the victim is the antithesis to the culture of violence and domination, and they embody that difference in the present. And the example he uses here is Gandhi. And in this book, he actually makes an interesting uh, point, which is sort of that Gandhi in a certain way is a sort of origin of contemporary identity politics. It was a successful identity politics, but the notion was, was the liberation of the salt march and the whole um, protest against the British in India was um, premised on the notion that the, uh, the ism, the essence, of, of, of the hint, you see it, you, that, that it was that, those sort of uh, points of excellence, which would be responsible for their success in overcoming their oppression. And I don't know about you, but do you see this a lot as well with certain fetishizations of the American working class by certain left-wing populists, right? I wonder what you think about how this notion works with right-wing populist ideology. Uh, do you see this notion of moral excellence um, at play in right-wing populism? I think what's interesting about Los Cerdo, what I like about him, is that he's offering a critique of left-wing populism, not so much right-wing populism. And then, um, um, of course, the Manicheanism, which I think we're all familiar with, with populism, which is sort of its, one of its or original, uh, maybe most popular understandings, right? Um, well, what's the problem with the Manicheanism? This is a nice point apropos Christianity, because he says very nicely that when you are Manichean about treating 
the poor or those below the mendicants um, as the vessels of a kind of untainted moral excellence, what you're also doing dialectically is you're shutting down um, the possibility of their transformation, right? So I think there's a very interesting mythical dimension at play there, where it's kind of a, a distinction between rationalist and mythical. So popul left populism becomes somehow tainted by its allure of the mythical, right? And one can think of the way in which many left leftists um, today look at the, the condition of the American proletariat, especially with the neglect of the, the deaths of despair uh, through maybe such prisms, through such lenses. But that's maybe something we could debate. So from a Marxist point of view, therefore, I think I've identified these three problems, right? Um, of populism that he identifies. And the number one uh, issue I think is maybe from, in my mind, the most important, which is that when we have a conception of uh, class, which is actually not based in class struggle, which is completely different than the populist understanding, you, are, you also foreclose solidarity um, because for Marx, the working class is something that's invented in struggle. It's not something that empirically pre-exists sociologically as a category. Populists have a quite static understanding, I believe, in that way. It's very sociological, right? Um, and then, oh yeah, I've already mentioned this mythical anti-rationalist. Um, um, so I think that this is interesting for us psychoanalytically, especially because Lacan will stress a lot of the danger of conceiving of the subject as a center of wholeness. This is his whole critique of ego psychology. So I think that when one extends that to a political psychoanalytic framework, one can quite easily see how the populist conception of, of the issue in front of us um, leads to certain dead ends. And my, my proposal here is that maybe what Brown is missing is a critique of populism, right? And maybe this is actually something we need today, right? Which is kind of imminent critique of the way in which the populist conceives of the antagonisms of our world, right? So this is what I gather from the Losurdo reading. I think it's spot on. I'm very much in favor of what he's saying. Um, yeah, I, lo I love this third point, right? Which is populism ultimately becomes a kind of anti-revolutionary point as well, right? It's kind of um, um, yeah, not a non-dialectical account of social strife, of social struggle, and so on, right? It's, it, it's reminiscent, we were reading Girard, René Girard's uh, Violence in the Sacred last night and made the point that the way that he uh, looks at Oedipus as uh, uh, related to the pharmakos, right? Which in, in Greek society, you had pharmakos as a, um, a kind of lower than low substratum lumpen proletariat uh, group who were eligible for sacrifice, but who were also the source of sacred divinity, right? So there's a certain sense in which populism reproduces the idea of struggle in that way, very kind of a religious manner, maybe. I wonder what you think of that proposal. That's how I'm reading it. So can I ask a sort of follow-up question about that? Um, Please. So are you sort of saying that one of the major takeaways here is something like, you know, don't, don't ontologize the difference between the people and not the people and or also don't ontologize the difference between proletariat, lumpen proletariat, capitalist class. Like, is this a, a matter of perspective on reading categories in relationship to one another? Uh, uh, you know, and, yeah. and I guess maybe does that then put it like, if there's like three ways of thinking about populism, right? It's like ideology or style or political logic. Uh, 
this seems like that's more in the kind of political logic school. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes. I, I think that's very fair. I like you use on ontologization. I think that's fair. Um, and I think he's pointing to the danger of precisely doing this. And he's wanting to preserve a less static epistemological understanding of both antagonism, but also of the formation of class struggle. So if the Marxist view is rationalist and opposed to this mythical ontologization, that means that it um, uh, has to have the kind of flexibility, right? To imminently compose solidarities of class. Because one of the things we've seen, I believe in the quarantine period with the general election and Black Lives Matter is a kind of triumph of the liberal ruling class to foreclose working class solidarity in America around certain signifiers, right? So there's sort of a, um, a great success that's going on, almost even a repressive success of the ruling class in terms of what is even possible for the proletariat to do in America, right? For example, it's not, you're not permitted to speak of class, right? In most institutions, right? Um, that's a great triumph of, of ruling class ideology that they've been able to, to, to concoct that, right? So solidarity is actually made impossible. I mean, I've spoken to many people from the baby boomer generation who say, look, the lesson of Bolshevik revolution is that, and what happened after, is that there is no solidarity between lump and proletariat and working class. Forget it, right? Totally off the table. And I think a lot of people looked at the Trump general election and they're saying the same thing, right? And that itself is an ontologization, right? So I'm very inspired by Lucerto's um, advocacy for solidarity. I don't know if that makes sense. Can I jump in briefly? Um, um, so um, just in terms of, of Brown, Wendy Brown and populism, um, her, her book on, on walls and walling on desired and desiring walls. Um, one of the, I think the, the nice points she makes about those who have an investment in the building of those walls and the policing of them yes. is um, the term purity, the purity that they're seeking through uh, that uh, practical as well as symbolic identification with the building of the wall. Um, so I think there is a kind of um, ref there, there, there is a concern with those kinds of populisms in Brown's work. I guess is what I would yeah, suggest. Yeah, well, that's that's helpful. I didn't. I'm, I have never encountered that work of hers. I know that several folks in our meeting are actually like researchers in populism. So I wonder if I invite others to jump in on this. Um, and I confess that Lucerto is giving, you know, a Marxist critique, right? But I think part of the reason we wanted to assign that reading is because um, maybe it's good that we make an inventory of the shortcomings of left-wing populism. Like we, we can critique right-wing populism very well, right? Anybody can, right? But can we critique left-wing populism, right? And does left-wing populism have a future? I mean, to me at this moment, I'm almost more convinced that right-wing populism has a brighter future. Yes, but like in France, it depends on the, on the leader. Uh, if you have not a good leader, it's quite difficult. I, I can see that as a left, left popularism in France. Uh, Mélenchon, it's terrible for the, for the left side, really terrible for the left side in France. And um, so that, that's a big problem. <laughs> and that's, you, you know, really a big problem. And... Um, also, um, it was very interesting some, uh, about the Le Pen, the, the, the right side. And there is a lot of studies about that. And you can see a lot of eight, the people eight. And um, I, <laughs> I, read an, I uh, wrote a note because I don't know if you understand me very well. But um, yesterday, there is a very, um, very interesting uh, um, psychoanalyst Cynthia Flory, and she talked about the uh, resentment 
And um, I think it's very important now to talk about the resentment because she says that the people, we can't fix, the people can't fix themselves. But the only way is the creativity. And I think, I don't know, but I think the, the, the populism, a lot of, you're, you can see a lot of aid from the people, a lot of resentment, and it's difficult to fix that. So I think the, the it's, and also I think in France, the problem with the left side, it's, it's the end of the communism. And the communism was for the people and for the workers was really a hope. And now there is no hope. So it's, it's, it's very difficult, you know, I don't. And um, also I think the humiliation it's a, is a big fact. And I think um, what I help it's um, the, the intellectuals. They don't like intellectual generally because um, I think they, they, feel, they feel in uh, humiliation and, um, and it's difficult to fix it. And uh, so I am agree with the psychoanalyst. You, you, I think you have, the, the, <laughs> it's not because I like art. I think the creativity, it's, it's, it's a very a big, big deal and big point. Thank you, Sylvia. That's really nice uh, reflections. Thank you for that. Um, it's interesting, Melanchon is different than Bernie Sanders because Bernie Sanders is the most popular politician, I think, in, in America. Yeah. But he has, not to use a, a strong term, but he's institutionally castrated, right? He has no power, right? They insist he has no power. But he has a kind of... Um, inspirational power right which yeah, yeah. but the the left are exhausted with the just mere inspiration and this kind of it's very condescending right so um there's a real sense that left populism needs to be completely reimagined in my opinion um do others agree with this other please jump in anybody i, I listen uh, bernie sanders and uh I was very enthusiastic by what he said, so, but for me, it was much more, it's very far away from Mélenchon. It's much more like a Rocard uh, who was the left side. It's, it's, it, here, the people think he's very, very extremist. And I don't think at all, he's not extremist at all. So I don't understand why the people say he's extremist. Is that not at all? I right. think he, and I think he can bring some, uh, uh, he can, he really bought some dreams, and that's what yeah. I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think it's, you mentioned hate and this kind of affects of the, pardon my dogs, <laughs> uh, run amok, right? This will be really uh, useful for us to read Lacan's television. Um, where he talks about affects of hate and love. And it will also be useful for us to get a, um, a grip on the Lacanian theory of affects because it's a very different way of theorizing affects, which is counterintuitive, but very different than how I think many of us have studied the, the wider um, affect theory that has really taken off in academic circles since the 1990s. So Lacan will give us a fresh way. And for me, what I want to start with next week, and Samo uh, Tomczyk will be with us as well, but we want to give um, a brief presentation on shame because the affect of shame, I think the most uh, significant one for Lacan, okay? Um, and if we look, and I'll give an excerpt of the other side of psychoanalysis seminar where he addresses this issue. Okay. And I really think that we talk about hate when we think about populism and so on. I'm not as convinced that it's as like clear of an affect or as um, central or primary, right? As to what's actually doing. So that's a little sort of flavor for next week. And Rathika, who's with us, is also going to facilitate next week. And so we'll have a kind of discussion on all of that uh, next week as well. Um, so 
So I have I have kind of a question because as I was going through um, these three types of uh, populism, and I was wondering, could we say that any left tradition that's ever lived has not had some kind of populism within it, like uh, like Maoism? Wasn't that didn't that also um, feed off of these um, the logic of the peasant, for example, or or even Trotskyism with um, its opposition, the left opposition, like as being morally more um, adept to the communist project than the Stalinist, for example, which I know Lozardo, like wrote his book about um, Stalin and things like that. So I'm, I'm wondering if a left politics at, is possible without at least speaking to these very logics of what um, Lozardo is calling populism, or I don't know, it just seems like this is, this is part of the very nature of trying to um, create coalition as well, right? Um, I don't know, yeah. what do you think? Oh, well, I'd love others to jump in, but I think Losuda makes the point there about hard and negri too, apropos the way they look at Palestine and the moral righteousness that he reads, I think in a nice way, um, in a kind of post-colonial world, he claims that hard and negri still privilege this populist logic of the, um, let's call it fetishization of the suffering other, right? So there's a certain um, criticism he's offering for leftists to not fetishize suffering qua suffering, right? That's a very interesting argument in some sense, right? Especially like um, when we think about Western advanced democratic societies undergoing this kind of populism, especially with Brown's critique where she's basically saying, look, most of the issue is not really material. It's a sense of a kind of symbolic crisis, a norms crisis, a loss of entitlement, a loss of privilege. So if we accept all of that, um, the issue of suffering is off the table in a certain sense. It's a, it's a different type of suffering. So we then have to think of a different kind of psychic suffering, you know, or affective suffering, right? And then if we do that, then we're in a completely new terrain in some sense from what these traditions give us. Does that make sense what I'm saying, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a different theory of suffering, right? It's a different way of, of the alleviation of what constitutes a suffering because part of the problem of collapse of the social uh, is that we no longer have the channels of causality or assigning causality of our suffering, whether it be racial, whether it be gender and so on, right? We kind of we have this implosion of that, right? I think social media is a good example of a place where there's a total implosion of that, right? There's a kind of lack of address to the other, right? Which is why Lacan will say, there's no sublimation. There's more, it's not this kind of uh, elevating of the object to the dignity of the thing. It's that the sublimation functions in what he calls the escabeau, the soapbox. And each individual can sort of satisfy it without an address to the other. So there's a kind of foreclosure, even of a necessity of sublimatory processes to be reliant on the field of otherness. As a, a claim that he makes about the kind of, you know, late capitalist reality. Um, I guess so, I'm asking if, there, if there's an outside of to populism, like if, is, there, is there such a thing? Like, I don't know, like it seems like at least from, I mean, I don't know enough about um, Lucerto, but from what we've read and these um, populism of um, these three types of populism, it just seems like these types are, they run through uh, this kind of, uh, the kind of politics that's tri that tries to be yeah. emancipatory. It just seems like, it, you, how else do you right. um, attempt? I mean, of course you, you have to complicate it, but is is there is this not another move as uh, John said earlier of trying to propose a pure politics that doesn't um, get its hand dirty dirty in the contradictions of populism I guess because it, it seems I'm thinking for example Chavez right or I mean it, it doesn't have to be him but you know there there's something about this um, this type of populism that it it might be easier now to to say that it's problematic because of the of the moment that we are in but if we look at the types of struggles that went on um i don't know like like i'm saying i'm from latin america i'm not 
from the US, but I've heard all these things about Maoism my whole life, how Maoist always very, and of course, the more you read, you realize it's not really like that, but does it not still have some kind of, I guess that's my question is, is there really an outside of populism that we can talk about? Well, I think Maoism is a good example. If you're being charitable to Mao, and I know it's hard to do that, <laughs> that there is a reason in revolt, reason in revolt, which is why Peju will read Mao through a Kantian lens, right? As a new categorical imperative of revolution, right? And so it's not a fetishization of the peasantry. It's um, oh, oh, the masses possess reason in the act of revolt, which was the inside of the Shanghai Commune, the, the, the pinnacle of success of the Chinese revolution, uh, where even the party apparatchiks, um, you know, their directives fell flat and the sort of this sort of uh, spontaneous activity of the masses formed a outlaw solidarities in the act of revolt. So that was the Maoist conjecture, which I think was maybe a kind of classical success of the Marxist proposal in, in distinction from this nostalgic fetishization of the original wholeness of the fellaheen or of the, of the peasant and of the, you know, so on, right? Which I think left-wing politics is very much, um, this, is, this, is, this is a critique of, of American left-wing politics, which is we look at the people abroad that suffer the most and we sort of grant them a certain agency, right? On the progressive left. Um, it's not to say that that's a, a inherently bad thing to do, but maybe it is fair to say that it's a sort of um, anti-dialectical thing. You know what I mean? Maybe it's a bad praxis. I don't know. I want to. I want to stop talking though, and others to jump in. Um, I've been thinking that maybe there's a certain urgency to uh, read a, a certain desire of contemporary right-wing populists for the success of left-wing populists, and like interpret the consequences of that. Like I'm thinking of like um, like Steve Bannon when he says how he wants to like align like the Sanders and the Trump people or Tucker Carlson and, and Trump himself having almost like these critical supports of Bernie after the fact. Um, I'm wondering if that's maybe somewhat dependent on that third point of the, the the false contradiction that then like obfuscates the difference between revolution and counter revolution. Um, so I'm I'm thinking a little bit even like the history like Germany in the 20s and 30s. Um, where you had like the Weimar Socialist Republic kind of forming the, the base for then the rightist populist Nazi counter-revolution to that. Um, and then even subsequent to that, uh, it seemed like you had a lot of social scientists who worked within the Weimar Republic, who then emigrated to the US similarly as the Frankfurt School, who became kind of like a base somewhat for constructing the neoliberal consensus of today. Uh, through like certain like Walter Lippmann encyclopedia social sciences endeavors. Um, and I would see them still as being like the base for what supports even like the ideology of like Biden and Harris. Um, and if maybe right now th they don't, maybe they even have like a certain kernel to them or a point to them in their sort of like trouncing of the Bernie revolution of what that the false contradiction and that obfuscation would then open up to uh, it maybe seems to me like an imperative on the left to try and think of a form beyond that because thinking of when Bernie was at his most successful in the early primaries and you had a lot of um, I almost feel like like re release of resentment from his followers a kind of like lording over of the democratic establishment of 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 their success if that sort of indicated that with maybe mixed with the lack of a program that they had to really like move beyond the stage of things that we're in that wasn't just a nostalgia for the welfare state, uh, if that wouldn't really open up an avenue for this obfuscated counter-revolution to firmly take hold. Like, like I can understand Bannon, like the best thing for him would be something like a Bernie or Corbyn sort of success and then failure upon its own contradictions for them to sort of take up the, the you know, the relay stick yeah. from then. Yeah, and I'll just say one thing and stop. It sort of problematizes Brown's, as Levi was saying, and the Stiegler's argument of philia, dialogue with the barbarians, right? It's very difficult to propose that right now. 
uh, in America, you know? Uh, and what would that even look like, right? Uh, it seems to me that there's a sort of uh, fear that if, if one does go down that road, it would lead to counter of right reaction, right? Instead of, I mean, there's there's a small movement of, of left populists that are trying to do that, that are saying actually as a Marxist, we should be pro-Trump to um, further continue the emisceration of the bourgeoisie, right? And they're, it's sort of beautiful theory of resentment that they present because the idea is like, let them be even more humiliated than we are, right? Let their humiliation quantitatively exceed ours, then we win. Pure revenge, right? Um, Gustavo, just following up on your um, thoughts about uh, Mao, um, Mao was very Schmittian, or probably better put, Schmidt was very Maoist. In, <laughs> so right at the outset of his collected writings, Mao begins by saying, who is the friend, who is the enemy? That is the issue. Um, and I think that that does feed into what you were suggesting about various forms of populism in an interesting way. Absolutely. Well, and to follow on from that, I think this gets back to this earlier question about um, sort of like, is there a future for left populism and versus the future for right populism seems very bright. It, it seems in part the future for right populism is very bright because right populism has a technology for almost immediately converting the overabundance of death and immiseration with which we are confronted into a, re a renewable resource for their for what they do. They, they're able to say the enemy is, the enemy is death, the enemy is suffering, and solidarity between us means you won't be exposed to that. But, you know, and I know it's maybe a little verboten amongst Lacanians, but like the, the Foucauldian point about life, not, life and death not being representable, you know, is one would say that that the impossibility of knowing what life and death are is, is the thing that they can kind of run their machine on over and over and over again. Whereas what you were saying earlier, Daniel, and a couple other people were hinting at, like, don't, don't, claim to, on, don't claim to kind of know or ontologize the people. One way to extend that thought would be to say, let's also not conflate exclusion with suffering, like being excluded from the parameters of a given political system is not the same with being dead, right? And, it, and is not necessarily the same with um, not being alive. It, it does mean to not live or be recognized as a person within the framework of that system as it's been constructed, but one wouldn't want to hand over to that sovereign apparatus a monopoly on making a decision between life and death. Um, and that like, sort of like, I'll shut up now, but it's like that one thing that's going on here is like left populism, what's left populism's answer to what lies behind the door every time is death. And then the right wing says, well, you won't have to occupy that position, we promise. You know, what the left says in answer to that question, I don't think it, it you know, maybe for structural reasons is like harder to put in a language. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll shut up now, but this no. is all very helpful. That was great. That was really good. Th Thanatos politics. Somebody said that uh, uh, Marcuse introduced Thanatos as a term to the Freudian lexicon. Freud never used that term. It's interesting. Um, yeah. Other thoughts, please. Uh, Feel free to jump in. Was anybody convinced of my Nietzschean uh, tirade? I sort of, uh... <laughs> now you're gonna think twice before you invoke him, maybe at the minimum, I hope. <clears throat> um, yeah, Nietzsche as pro-Christian is a wild idea. It is, I agree. Um, so, yeah, in the, in the meantime, until next week, uh, let's hit the slack for chatting and discussion and so on. I mean, I don't know how many folks are comfortable with Lacan or um, new to Lacan. We, Wilfred Verecke actually was a student of Lacan, 
um, and he uh, is uh, the founder of the forum, which is uh, founded by Colette Soler. And Colette Soler, um, her book, Lacanian Affects, I have provided an excerpt of that in the Dropbox. She's an excellent um, student of Lacan and pract practitioner. So it's an excellent excerpt to really, we're talking about, you know, Brown and Marcuse tell us and Stiegler tell us that the issue is this kind of, you know, unhinged affects run amok, right? So then it's really interesting to interrogate the structuralist Lacan who would privilege the signifier over affect. And so then what does that then mean? You know what I mean? Um, can we still actually speak of a logic of the signifier? This is actually something Samo, you'll see in the description of his talk, because um, one of the things he's really been big on lately is a return to the structuralist Lacan, right? Not so much the late Lacan, but the kind of Lacan of his prime where the signifier and the logic of the signifier is central. So, you know, it'll be a really interesting point of contrast, I hope. And, um, you know, hopefully uh, we'll work through Lacan patiently uh, next time. Um, Daniel, I just wanted to suggest uh, for those of you who maybe don't know, there's, I'll put it in the Slack as well, but there's a um, YouTube of the entire thing of Lacan reading or reciting television. Um, and it's truly amazing if you've never heard him speak to, uh, you know, sort of listen to the text because obviously the French has all sort of psychoanalytic assonances that, you know, his little jokes and gestures and wild screaming sort of gives the text another dimension. So if you have time to check it out, um, you know, I, I recommend it and I'll, I'll drop it in the online thing too. Thank you, Ruthie. And thank you for volunteering to um, help facilitate. Uh, yeah, no worries. Also, it's, at, it's, it's Rithika, by the way. Oh, Rithika, I'm, I'm sorry. It's okay. It was my best guess. I should have preface by saying I hope that I'm missing. Um, um, there's another reading we have from John Kopjak, which we'll put up there, um, which is quite good on Lacan and affect theory. If you want to take a look at that too, um, we'll, we'll post it on the Dropbox as well. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, I'm happy to conclude unless there's any other comments or clarifications before we, it's really nice to be with you all, spend Thursday evening with you guys. Um, hopefully you're all staying healthy and safe. Uh, yeah, it's scary out there with this, uh, at least in, but really everywhere. So um, it's a good time to read. Yeah. <laughs> This is a bit of a selfish request that if anybody has any like readings on, um, let's say like uh, eternal return and death drive, like how they interact with repetition that like go beyond the lose. Uh, if, if anybody knows anything like that, I could throw it in the Slack, it'd be really appreciated. There's Zupanchik's The Shortest Shadow on Nietzsche from a psychoanalytic standpoint, which would be very good. But I'm sure you're familiar with that. Um, okay, well, um, Thank you. And thank you to you. We'll see you in seven days. Adios. Thank you. Bye.